Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Universal Auto Classification Masterclass webinar series. I'm Sandy Serkis, President and CEO of Valora. Uh, we're going to get underway very shortly. Um, if everyone could please, um, if you have questions or commentary that you'd like to add, please go ahead and uh, type that into the little chat window. We'll get to as many questions as we can. You've all been muted for the webinar uh, just to keep the distraction noise down. So if you do have a question, please do type it into the chat bar. Okay. Um, we're going to begin with a poll, as we always do. Uh, there are quite a few of you out there, in case you're wondering. Uh, and so we'd kind of like to know who you are. So please tell us um, where you come from, what your kind of organizational identity is. And again, I'll, I'll share the results with that just as soon as most of them come in. About half of you have voted already. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and show you all that. So you can kind of see who's here. Um, pretty evenly split between corporate and law firm types, a handful of government agency and uh, professional services, and even a few other. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I've got one more quick poll for you, and then uh, we'll dive right in. So the uh, next poll question, if you don't mind, is who are you? Uh, you gave us your organization. Now tell us what your role and responsibility is. And this helps me to, to kind of gear the conversation in the right direction. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of you are involved in records and information governance. Good, you're in the right place. Uh, but we welcome, we welcome all comers here at Valora. <laughs> all right, looks like nearly everybody's voted on that one too. So here's who you are. Uh, kind of overwhelming this time with uh, records and information governance, which is great because that's a big, big focus of today's webinar. So that's who everybody is. All right, we're going to dive right in now uh, and begin the webinar. All right, today's webinar is uh, about records retention and data lifecycle management. If you don't know me already, I'm virtually saying hello to you. I'm the one speaking to you now. I'm, I go by Sandy, and uh, I am one of the original founders and the president and CEO of Valora Technologies. Um, I've met many of you in my travels all over the country. There are going to be many more in the coming weeks, so uh, please do reach out and say hello. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, we're, we're tackling a very near and dear topic to, I think, probably everybody's heart on this uh, webinar today. We're going to be talking about records retention, retention in general, and uh, data lifecycle management. Specifically, of course, because it's me and it's Valora, we're going to be talking about auto classification as a primary driver and framework for those items. Um, as I said earlier, this is a master class, uh, so we're going to make certain assumptions about what you know already. I will give brief uh, introductions to topics in, in case you are a newbie, uh, but this is generally geared at a more sophisticated, more uh, kind of intermediate or master level uh, person. We're going to be talking about different types of strategies to handle retention in a more modern context. So we'll be focusing heavily on electronic records, about the integration of different types of content, and of course, some of the newer technologies coming out that are pretty much game changers for managing and controlling content. We're also going to talk about a case study. Uh, we're going to have uh, someone from that case study join us in a future webinar down the line, but I'll give you a little taste of it today um, to explain how uh, clients are implementing solutions that utilize auto classification and really changing the game inside their companies. And then we're going to give you some tools to kind of really kind of critically evaluate what's the circumstance in your organization? Can it be better? How can you make that happen? And how can you set up solutions today that will carry you forward since we're in such a rapidly changing environment? 
All right. Uh, as I mentioned, this is, we are actually in session two today of our masterclass series this year, 2019. There's actually seven total sessions. So this is number two. If you, for some reason, miss number one, uh, you're going to get a copy of this presentation at the end and you can click this link and it will take you to the recorded session for session one, which was kind of an overview session about auto classification and what do we mean? Why are we calling it universal auto classification and all of that fun stuff? So if you missed the first one, don't panic. You can go ahead and watch this. We are also recording today's session. So in case you want to keep a collection of Valora webinars, you can do that. We certainly do, so you don't really have to. If you ever want to go back and um, listen to or watch some Valora content, I encourage you to visit our YouTube channel, which is growing every day. Uh, there's quite a lot of content out there, so if you're trying to come up to speed on these topics, it's an excellent location, and there's a link at the end of this presentation. So this is what we're going to be covering today, as I said, retention and data life cycle. Um, not surprisingly, we're going to evolve into legal hold next time. I will be talking a little bit about it today. And then as we progress on through the series, these are the other topics. And then at the end, we're going to be bringing back everybody who participated for kind of a super master class, a master master class um, in December. So hope to see you all at all of them. Feel free to bring your friends. This is free of charge. Uh, so we welcome everybody. All right, let's dive in. So most of you probably know what auto classification is, but for the one shy person who's out there and says, what are you talking about? I'm going to just give a brief overview because today's topics, retention and uh, life cycle are going to be discussed in the context of auto classification. And you'll hear me use these terms over and over throughout the session. So auto classification is a technology that encompasses two major pieces, a metadata piece, in other words, analysis about content, meta meaning about metadata, data about data. Uh, and uh, you can think of that in terms of attributes about a file or, or a record. And then rules, you can think about that as kind of an, a set of actions. So you can kind of think about metadata telling you what is this content and rules telling you what should I do with it. You can kind of hear those retention overtones already, right? It's helpful to know how you're going to treat something if you know what it is. And so that's what the two pieces are. What is it and what do I do about it? And just so that we're all on the same page, the auto in auto classification refers to software. It is software performing this kind of analysis. So it's not people sitting there doing some sort of form of metadata data entry. No, 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 no. This is software analyzing the file or the document content and using uh, recognition algorithms. In other words, textual analytics it is going through and figuring out different really important features of the file. Number one, document type. And we'll talk a little while about the relationship between document type and record type. All kinds of other content analytics, things like author, recipient, title, subject, keywords, other useful things like what kind of content is in there? Is there anything sensitive in there? Is there anything obsolete in there? You know where I'm going with that one. And so on and so forth. So those recognition algorithms are contained inside the software. Uh, and they are also configurable, which allows for a lot of flexibility. Ultimately, uh, auto classification is, is a task that kind of happens in the middle of activities. We're going to talk about that more later, so I won't spend too much time. But really, it's between where the content lives and how it's going to be used. I will be referring from time to time to Valora's software product called Powerhouse, uh, because obviously that's the product I know best, and it very much defines my understanding of auto classification. If you ask me about other solutions, I'll do my best to answer, but I'm, I'm really not an expert in those, and I am certainly an expert in Powerhouse. If you're lost already, that's okay. We still love you, but you might want to check out 
our webinar series from last year, which was a five-part webinar series um, with uh, Julie Colgan from Epic and me kind of hosting a sort of fireside chat on what is auto classification, how does it work, what's important, what's not, how do you use it. So if you're looking for your auto classification basics, you want to check out this series. If you already know what that is, stay tuned because here we go. All right. It's important to know when we get into a discussion about retention and life cycle management, it's important to know how auto classification works. And I know I cover this on every webinar, but there's always somebody who's new, so I'm going to go through it quickly. Basically, what Powerhouse does is either take data in ingesting or looking at data where it lives, what we call processing in place, so leaving the files where they are. And one way or another, it's going to get to a text rendition of that content. So if it's a, a native electronic file, ESI, uh, it's going to extract text and utilize a, a text rendition of the file. If it's a scanned image, it's going to use OCR. Um, and then you can get fancy if it's something like an audio or a video file. We actually have speech to text algorithms that take that sound and make text out of it. And so you have to get to text one way or another to do content analytics. So that is what happens at this step. From there, once we have kind of a text rendition, then lots of things open up. Um, and that is the process that we call tagging. Uh, remember we said rich metadata, that's this step where essentially the software is going to parse that text and figure out all kinds of attributes about each and every file or record. And it's going to go ahead and make a database record about each piece of content where it's storing the attributes of that file. You can almost think of it almost like a blood test where it is keeping track of every single piece of information, that metadata about the data. And then finally, we come to disposition, which is a big hot word in retention, and we're going to talk about it a lot today, uh, where we figure out the what do I do with it part of the equation. And that's where we use both the fielded data and the content itself to go ahead and provide disposition. In other words, what should I do with this file? Should I keep it? Should I toss it? Should I quarantine it? Should I lock it down? There's lots and lots of different things that can happen with uh, content. And so we're going to have a whole discussion on disposition. All right. I'm just going to stop for a moment and bring up my little tool here and see if there are any questions so far. Looks like no. I will keep going. OK. OK. All right. So first up, let's get some terminology down, because on the call, there are folks who have a records background. There are folks who have an e-discovery background. There's likely some IT folks. Everybody talks about things a little differently, and I tend to use all of them. And so I want to get them down, and let's be clear about actually what are some of the subtle differences, and then what do we mean when we kind of cross-pollinate in that way. So first up, records. Um, some people think that records mean only paper that has been specifically designated as a record and stored and maintained in accordance. Other people have started to include electronic files that serve the same purpose. Sometimes you'll hear e-records, and these are pieces of content that function as records, but they happen to be electronic in nature. Um, and I have a, a, I do have a question for, for folks. I'd be interested in your response, so go ahead and, and type into the little uh, window. What do you think of a scanned file that was once upon a time paper and now exists in, let's say, a PDF image or a TIFF image? Is that considered an e-record or not? Uh, I ask a lot of people that, and I get widely varying answers, so feel free to weigh in, and I'll kind of look those over and, and see which way we're trending as a group. I didn't think to make it a poll. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the, the kind of the key attribute of a record is that someone somewhere has designated it as such, it almost like kind of crowned that content, thou shalt be a record. And so it has special rights and privileges and access and things like that. But somebody has gone through that step of crowning that file a record. 
That's one of the fundamental differences there. The next thing is documents. Now, I tend to use this word very loosely because some people will say a document must be physically paper. Others will say it's a document if it has written content and it is used to document something. And I tend to use it to mean a nice little handy collection of content that is easily digestible. So to me, a report is a document, an email is a document. And yes, we could argue whether it is or isn't, but you will hear that word come out of my mouth. And I just want you all to know that I use that interchangeably between paper document or electronic document. I generally mean something with written text on it. Okay, and then we have the kind of twin sister to documents, which is electronic files. But this one's a little bit loose too, because an electronic file may not necessarily contain useful content. You can have a DLL, which is an operational file on your machine, or you can have a virus file. It's a file, but it is not document in nature. It's not content or text in nature. So this is a little bit too open for my taste. Uh, but people use it all the time, and so do I. Then we get to data. This one's really kind of smushy because data can mean an awful lot of things. It can mean the zeros and ones being stored as bits and bytes on uh, a server. It could mean literally the output of somebody's work, like uh, you know, a lab experiment or temperature. Um, and people tend to use it. They'll say your electronic data. And what they mean is your electronic content. So of course, that's the last one. Um, and the fundamental difference really between data and content is that content has an eye towards text. And that's why it's called often content analytics. You do hear data analytics as well, but that's a broader field and it can literally mean analyzing data like a stock ticker that really isn't too heavily content oriented. Suffice to say, all of these come out of all of our mouths all the time, and the only one with a special jewel in its crown sort of seems to be records, and I will argue that that is falling away as well, and that these have become interchangeable terms. Now, I'm certainly going to interchange them today, and this has major ramifications. If your job has something in the title like records manager or records retention, because what's starting to happen is a slippery slope into the rest of it. In fact, the more we kind of find ourselves in the keep everything world, and I know nobody on this call would ever recommend that as a policy, and yet we're all living in it all the time, I would argue that these definitions are starting to become one and the same. And that is going to inform a lot of the conversation going forward from this point. I'm just going to briefly look at what you guys said. <laughs> you guys are funny. <laughs> All right, there's lots and lots of thoughts. I'm going to have to parse your thoughts later. So thank you, everybody. Okay, um, moving on. We've already now kind of covered this kind of smushy terminology happening. The next thing that you might ask yourself is, of course, well, who's talking and whose point of view? What a records manager might deem as a record might be very, very different than, say, what someone in legal thinks is permanent record or system of record. So let's talk about perspective. We tend to see three different perspectives in this universe. And since we just talked about records for a moment, I'm gonna kind of skip that one. Let's talk about the other two. Somebody sitting in the, in the perspective of legal is basically kind of, if it exists, it's discoverable. That is how that group or that person is going to think about content in general. And so on the one hand, they're very aligned with records who are looking to only keep that which is valuable on the other hand, legal talks out of both sides of its mouth, doesn't it? They really don't like the fact that everything is discoverable and available, and yet they tell everyone, don't throw anything out ever, just put it all under legal hold. And so legal is kind of sending its own mixed message, but it's also conflicting a little bit with what is happening in records. So legal kind of views the world as, if it exists, it's my responsibility. And what they mean is, it's my risk 
responsibility. So if any of that content, if any of those files in existence might cause an area of risk for the company, then it's my responsibility. That exposure is my responsibility. And in that sense, they're somewhat aligned with IT. IT also takes responsibility, but not legal responsibility. They take sort of management responsibility. And so legal's kind of corollary statement is, well, if it's out there, it's my problem. I have to manage it. And so legal has to make sure that that content exists, is functional, gets upgraded, doesn't get corrupted, nobody can steal it and so on and so forth. But both of them are aligned in this sense of, if it exists, I have to own it in one way or another. That's not necessarily the case in records, or at least it hasn't been historically. And I would argue it's becoming more and more so. One, because legal and IT need to share that burden and records is kind of the one with the clue. Um, and two, because the notion of, well, everyone will just designate what's a record and that's all I have to manage, that's kind of going out the window as well because the task of determining records is too overwhelming. And we're gonna talk about that, about how do you get around the fact that there's more data being born every minute than there are humans on the planet. This notion of, oh, well, will somebody somewhere will just designate records, that's gotta go. It's impossible, it's impossible to keep up. So this is a little bit of the kind of cross purposes and mixed messages that are coming out to, of course, the employee in the organization who hears from all parties. All right, let me just see if there's an actual question. Lots of commentary. Okay, I don't actually see a question, so I'll, so I'll continue. All right. What's starting to happen to kind of accommodate these different worldviews and these different uh, accountability uh, purposes is this notion of information governance, which by definition is cross-departmental and really should include at least one party from each of these three camps and probably others. And once you kind of get to that notion of information governance, you're specifically looking across these perspectives and trying to account for ownership accountability and management. And so that takes us to this notion of retention as a spectrum instead of a binary, okay? Once upon a time, you either kept or disposed of something, end of story. And if you kept it, it was only a matter of time till you either disposed it or kept it forever. And so you sort of have this kind of binary view and like some other things in society, we're discovering that perhaps this is a bit more fluid. And so I'm gonna kind of follow up on that concept. So the things that are pretty clearly at the extremes, at the edges of the spectrum, you have of course rot, who really in an ideal word, world, you would remove it promptly. Um, anyone not familiar with rot, redundant, obsolete, trivial, basically the junk. Things like uh, auto replies to emails or spam or viruses, junk. On the other end of the spectrum, on the keep end of the spectrum, of course, permanent records, which I presume you would keep forever uh, barring some sort of physical issue. And so those are the kind of polar extremes. Now what happens is you move towards the middle is where it gets a little more spectrum-y. So right kind of behind permanent records is kind of the, the shadow uh, permanence of legal hold. Uh, and legal hold is, for those that aren't as familiar, legal hold is essentially a legal dictum that says this content in question is either absolutely or potentially going to be used in a litigation matter. And so we must retain it in the matter in which it was kept and used. And so legal hold kind of sort of swoops in out of nowhere and says, everybody halt, lock down that content. And the, the notion of legal hold isn't really all that old. 
Um, particularly for electronic records, it's an outgrowth of the 2006 changes to the federal rules of civil procedure. And so the whole notion of e-discovery and all of that kind of was, was really born then. And so as a society, we're not that far along into working with legal hold. And so everybody understands what legal hold is and, you know, very compliant with its requirements, except to take things out of legal hold. Very hard to get organizations to let go of a legal hold after the matter is closed, there's no longer a threat, whatever it is, when do things and how do things come off of legal hold? So you have this kind of quasi permanent murky zone that, which is kind of, that's why I have it kind of on the darker blue side of things. How long does this keep exactly? And what happens in the conflict between keeping something? What about when it comes off a legal hold and it turns out you didn't need to be retaining it anymore? Anybody looking at that information? So this is that, that's what I mean, sort of a shadow permanence over here. You have a, a similar thing on the other end of the spectrum, which is data subject access requests. Uh, anybody not familiar with that term? That's a GDPR term. Um, and what it basically means is a European citizen can request of someone who holds their data and say, hey, I'd like to know what you have on me, please. And I have a right to correct it. I can ask you to remove it, uh, but you have to get back to me in a very short time window. And so this is a little bit kind of like the rot discussion. It's not rot in the sense that it's junk, but it's a, a special designation that potentially is up for removal. And so instead of kind of remove as a matter of process, the way you would with rot, you're gonna kind of remove on demand as required, as needed. So this is a little bit uh, stronger version than this, but it's kind of over in the dispose column. And then you have the middle, active, right? Maybe, sorta, nobody's really sure. And so, we have this kind of murky zone in the middle. It's clearly not dump immediately. It's clearly not keep forever. So now we're in what I call the smushy middle. And this is the part that really retention should be minding the store. There's another big group that I didn't quite know where to fit into that network, which I'll call the orphan data which is all the stuff left over from various activities like employees who've left, uh, old archives and repositories, paper records that nobody's ever touched, um, data that arrives via acquisition when the people don't arrive, but the data does. So there are lots of kind of orphan scenarios of content out there that really are hard to classify in the dispose or keep column. All of this together kind of is what I call that squishy middle ground. And this is where a more sophisticated managed view of retention uh, can solve the problem. All right, so what we have here is kind of the emergence of two different approaches to retention. Historically, retention is married, managed as a top-down uh, implementation. Someone in records management, maybe legal, maybe IG, determines a set of record types, publishes that as a record schedule or record policy, retention policy, and says, all right, business units, all right, employees, everybody figure out your own stuff and figure out which of my 37 different potential records schedules or retention schedules it fits in, and then manage accordingly. Thank you. Have a nice day. Um, this has had limited success out there. Uh, generally, now this may be somewhat self-selection, but generally the clients that interact with Valora have raised their hand and cried uncle and said, this is not working. Um, I can't say that for every organization, it must be working for some because everybody keeps trying to do it. But the uh, what you have here is, is a real split in knowledge. You have records personnel who are literally encyclopedic experts on record type and on retention scheduling. And yet the onus for, for kind of employing it is literally on the employee who really doesn't understand these things, takes the best shot if they're nice and somebody's looking over their shoulder or otherwise ignores it. Um, I'll come back to the, the, the uh, time issue in a second. So that's kind of that top-down approach. And part of the reason that the world has kind of evolved that way is again, because it's kind of evolved out of paper. 
Uh, and this notion of saying, well, we'll just make bit broad buckets and either we'll make the buckets broad enough or we'll add a couple more and we'll attempt to educate everybody or maybe we'll kind of say, well, this department only needs those six schedules and that department only needs those 10 schedules and we'll try to, to force it down onto them. It reminds me of my mom trying to shove me into clothes that didn't fit me and say, yeah, it's fine, go, go to school, wear it. It feels a little like that. The other approach is to go bottom up. In other words, to start from the content itself and to understand not as humans, but as uh, machinery, to understand what that content is and have that inform the decisioning around retention and to have retention structures that are aware of content specifically, not necessarily by humans telling it, but by parsing and auto classification technologies. So the difference really between these two approaches is that one assumes that the record type is kind of the dominating point of view. And the second one, the bottom up, assumes that the documents, the files themselves are the dominating point of view. And what you gain from the second approach is a centralization of expertise so that your subject matter experts are also the ones enacting the status. Now, you may go out to the business units and say, you know, are you okay with this? Do you want to approve it? Do you know this, we've done it preliminarily. However you want to kind of hedge, that's fine. But really the onus is on the centralized information governance team to utilize the benefit of that content analysis to, to tie it into the record types with a set of hierarchical rules and then have that be the kind of guiding force rather than the individual employees. So that's really what the change is. And this of course is made possible by auto classification. Um, now I'll return to this notion of time. Up here in the kind of more simplified but simplistic also uh, approach, Another thing that we hear is that content tends to be managed by time and time only. So what do I mean by that? A good example, and I've heard many variations on this theme, tends to be around email. So our email is automatically deleted after 90 days. Our email is automatically deleted after a year. Anything that's like that, that's just pure kind of machete based on time. So you could have the world's most important document, and I don't care, day 91, out it goes. That's what I mean by managed by time. Typically non-records. Records are going to have their own management. You guys know that. Um, over in this universe, you have a notion of value. How do you get to the value of a document? Well, you have to understand its content, and then you also have to understand its context. And we talked about that a lot last time, so I won't go into it, but basically understand what that file contains and certain types of relevance to different business operations. And then you can look at that, you can look at value over time as, instead of just a pure time basis. So I'm gonna kind of show you an example of that. So here are two different emails. Um, one I received and one I wrote. Uh, obviously, this one is good old spam and despite however many hundred million spam filters I put in, this thing still got through. And this is a perfectly legit, straightforward email that actually, if you read it, it talks about a business transaction. So this is spam and this is pretty important content. If you're managing email to say, well, it's purely time-based, then day 91, out they both go. Does that make sense? I mean, I would argue to you that this one should be deleted immediately. And for whatever reason, it missed the spam filter. Okay, fine. You know, spammers get more and more clever it's, the, it's just an arms race between the spam filter and the spammer. And so being able to identify information like this and go ahead and you know knock it out as rot prior to the 90 days would be very valuable. Similarly, looking at this content and recognizing, oh my God, there's a signed contract in there. That is pretty important stuff for sure. That needs to go over towards records. You can either rely on Sandra, who let me tell you is very, very busy and is very likely to forget or mess that up. Or you can have systems behind the scene saying, ah, I can recognize this content. I can recognize what this is. 
this needs to be retained, maybe not in the email, but it needs to be retained properly. And I don't want to wait till day 91 to figure that out. So that's my argument about purely time-based versus value-based. <laughs> okay, humorous comments disguised as questions, although much appreciated, are not going to go public at this time. <laughs> I'll just put that out there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so moving forward in the interest of time, as it were. All right. So the whole point, remember this from the beginning, is to use auto classifications so that we can understand the content and manage it better. So I'm gonna show you a little bit how that works. So we're gonna get into a discussion about disposition. <laughs> uh, so this is a rule, what we would call, Powerhouse has a rules editor, and you can see it's a retention rule, and it's just a very simple one to give an example, and you can see that it's using content understanding in its syntax. So it is understanding the nature of the content. It knows the document type. Now that may or may not also be a record type, but it knows the document type is a contract. It actually knows way more than just that. And I'm gonna show you an example in a minute, but your rule may only care about the document type and let's say an effective date and saying, okay, well, the rule that I'm firing, which is you know current year plus seven on doc type contract, then it says, yeah, that is clearly still active. That needs to be retained. Okay, so this is a little bit how the rules work. I'm gonna show you some fancier ones. And so here, for example, is how we might auto classify junk. I did show this last time, so I'll go through it quickly. Does this need to be retained? And again, not relying on a person or a spam filter to determine that this should not be retained, but using a pretty intelligent system underneath that's doing a whole bunch of other stuff to also identify rot and therefore not retain it. Rot is just another way of saying do not retain. And so for those of you who are oriented around retention, rot is basically like the anti-retention. So here's how you find it. We analyze the text. We realize that you know five of the seven words on this page are on a watch list for rot. And of course you can fill it up with whatever you like. Mazel tov, happy birthday, it's a boy. You can do a date calculation between the date, the content date. There's lots of different dates to play with. And yes, of course, a good system would play with all of them. Creation date, last modified date. This is a content date, which is often the, the best one to use because it is the date that the original party intended. Um, that becomes... It, incredibly important in things like contracts or approvals or things that have multiple dates that uh, have legal events kicking off of them. And there's no further content, very high graphics, uh, 4,000 identical hash value copies throughout an organization. All of these are kind of indicators and statistical probability says it's over the threshold of whatever confidence level you care for to say, yeah, this is junk, this should be removed, or that is not retained. And so this is how auto classification goes through this. No person, nobody's sitting down in their email going, you know, message by message junk, message by message retain, stick it in, you know, the records repository. It's just doing it. And you can do it before it ever lands on the desk, after it lands, at every any point. You can do it in the, you know, the message folder and the server. All of those are just kind of configuration details. Here's another one. Now we're gonna get real fancy. So I was showing you kind of the interplay between retention and rot. Now I'm gonna show you the interplay between retention and data privacy. Because data privacy is a real thorn for retention. Because an otherwise sort of erstwhile, perfectly retention worthy document suddenly can get derailed because of the presence of PII or some other sensitive data point. Or because somebody, let's say you're, you have a European citizen, because they've asked you to, period. And so now you have these kind of 
uh, incursions into standard retention. So here's an example. It's clear PII in this document. This is what we call warning sign PII. So again, you wonks know this. Um, because there is a personal name on a mortgage loan application that also lists an address, you can infer that that address belongs to these people and therefore this becomes PII. One of my favorite, favorite gnarly examples. And so once you get to that classification, yeah, there's active PII in this. And now you get to, okay, it's not so much a question of retention, yes, no, or retention, how long, those are all important, but it's also retention in what manner. So maybe this needs to be retained. I'm, I'm sure a bank would tell you it must be retained. It's a URL application, of course it must be retained for whatever period in their policy. But how does it need to be retained? Does this need to be locked down? I would argue yes. There's quite a bit of sensitive information in here. I'm sure that their policies, uh, if the retention policy doesn't indicate it, there'd be some other compliance policy about handling of personal information. And this is where retention and privacy need to get on the same page. So now you have retention rules based on content analysis. So if this is, you know, and this is just a simple one that we dummied up, it's not anybody's, but it's not that far off from the many that we've seen, where there's some sort of uh, doc type or record type, some sort of usually description, and some sort of retention period, and maybe, maybe, maybe some sort of handling of what's supposed to happen at the end of that retention period. But what's missing is that column about sensitive data, access, privacy, and that needs to start entering the discussion around retention. Once you have a structure like this, which is using a kind of hierarchical rule set that is aware of those attributes, see doc type, okay? And this is, this is just a simple one. You could have 15 different attributes in here, you know, has PII, could be an attribute. And again, that's all coming from that attribute, that metadata creation part that was sort of part A. This is part B, You having the rules utilize that information to make classification designations. So this is just kind of a little snippet inside the Powerhouse Rules Editor. I'm gonna show you what it looks like it, sort of functionally, and then I'm actually gonna show you a snapshot of the Rules Editor. Again, that's how you know you're in the advanced class here because we don't just show that to newbies. All right. So here is a contract, obviously. Contracts almost universally need to be retained for at least a long period of time, if not indefinitely. And so again, rather than relying on the party who's holding the contract or who signed the contract or whose email it's sitting in, let the software do the work. Knows what kind of document this is. Knows it's a contract. It can find the effective date so it can start to build the time ticker if that is the basis on which you want it to go. It could be effective date, it could be signature date, it could be whatever the last clause hangover date is. You know, uh, confidentiality will remain in effect for three years after the termination of the contract. Do you want that to be the date? Again, you might have to think a little bit, but once you do, you can kind of set that up as a rule and henceforth it will be dealt with. I'm going to pull a lot of other stuff while we're at it. You may or may not need that for retention, but as long as you're pulling data, pull it. And so what you kind of come down to is you can map this doc type to a record type. You can map it to a retention schedule. And I see, I already kind of say, is it seven years or is it more complicated? You know, which date exactly? And you can also dictate what this stands for obsolescence handling. So what is it that should happen when it hits that date? We're gonna talk in a minute about the difference between date and handling, but in this case, it should be deleted at that time. All right, moving on. Now that you've seen kind of what happens, let's take a look at the rules editor. So this is, an extremely old screenshot of the uh, Powerhouse Rules Editor to give you a feel of how it works. 
generally we don't expect clients to kind of be experts and to get in here and do this kind of thing, but increasingly so people want to learn this. Um, and so we are actually putting together Valora University so people can come and get certified. Um, and then they too can do all kinds of fancy management of rules so that you can run retention as you see fit, utilizing all these levers and controls based around content analysis. I am not a rules editor expert. At some point, we'll probably do a uh, webinar or tutorial on that. Of course, I invite you all to come, but I did want to give you a little bit of a sneak preview of what goes on kind of behind the scenes. And so now we're going to get into disposition. <laughs> uh, I looked at probably, I don't know, 35, 40 different workflows of how people provide disposition on records in preparation for this uh, webinar. And what I found was a very strange use of the word disposition, uh, because what I kept seeing was people using disposition to mean the act of disposal. And that is not quite true. Uh, disposition, I these are these are the definitions straight off of um, Merriam-Webster and Google are far more realistic in general and I think in a records capacity which is the tendency of something to act a certain way its disposition or the uh, relation to other things that determine how that thing will act or be treated and so that is precisely the definition that we should be using in a retention capacity. In other words, the disposition of a file or a record or a document should be based on lots of topics. It's what type of document is it? How sensitive is it? Who should have access to that? Is it useful? When's the last time anybody touched it? Should they be, did they not touch it because they're not aware of it? Should it be promoted or demoted or sequestered? There are a lot of different topics that go into a true disposition of content far beyond dispose it or don't dispose it. If you think of it instead of disposal, if you think of it as treatment, one of which might be throwing it away defensively, but there are many others that are also involved in the treatment, and it may not necessarily have disposition only at the end of life. It may have disposition throughout its life, starting at its birth, changing when different things happen in the organization. For example, new regulation comes out, or somebody requests the removal of that content. That is a disposition moment, an event, that's going to affect the disposition kind of marking of that content. And so I would suggest that disposition should mean the act of assessing the appropriate status of that content given a variety of contextual, legal, and business concerns. And so if that is a definition that you subscribe to as well, then what if we could get to that disposition, while well, calling a true disposition now, sooner and repeatedly. In other words, a refresh, a reevaluation, or a confirmation, if you like, of the disposition of that content on a regular evergreen basis because the content can change and certainly the world can change. So that takes us to separating the two components of disposition. The, the date, meaning the obsolescence date, and the handling, meaning what happens at that time. So obsolescence date, sometimes people will call it a retention date. I like to call it an obsolescence date because that's when it no longer meets the criteria to be retained, but it may have other criteria. And so, you know, like how it is handled in its treatment. And so that of course is the second part of the, the discussion. How should this be handled? And again, if you know what your content is at the outset, either it already exists and you've analyzed it or you're analyzing it at its birth, you know, the minute someone hits save or send or auto save and you can figure out what that file is, what that document is, you can automatically put, even if it's uh, presumptive, you can automatically give it all kinds of designations, including obsolescence potentially before they've even sent it, if you want to intercept the email feed. 
So when Valora analyze, when Powerhouse analyzes content, it's actually tracking both of these separately so that you can build rules or build reporting, which is really just another format. It's sort of rules put onto paper uh, so that you can report on things like how much is out of date or what different types of handling will I need when this material comes up to its obsolescence point. And that takes you to this notion of ongoing perpetual disposition. So as I said, you can you start at birth, and birth may mean arrival or discovery of content, not necessarily literally the file was born this second, but it may have been acquired and received this second, or it may have been submitted. Lots of different ways content is born. And some sort of disposition provided right there at the outset and then what I would call informed disposition. So using those other considerations like privacy, data access. We only talk lightly about legal hold because that's our webinar next time, but kind of who's on top, legal hold or retention, and what happens when that flips? And then a refresh, this notion of refreshing that status on a regular basis. You can do it on an event-based basis, sure, but you can also do it on a regular basis just to make sure that nothing has gotten corrupt. There's not a second copy or a version or a near dupe. Lots of different reasons to do a disposition refresh. And as I hopefully argued to you guys, time-based being the weakest of those. You can use it, and I put it here because uh, people do, and sometimes that's all you have to go on. Okay, fine. But why not use an actual analysis of the value of the thing first? And then that takes you to this notion of perpetual management and control. Yes, of disposition, but of everything else related to the life cycle of that content. And what we would call a kind of a context aware management uh, style. So I've talked about this with you guys before. If this is the typical enterprise setup where your data lives in lots of different locations, some's in the cloud, some's in email, file share, SharePoint, you name it. And these are the use cases. Note that retention is a common one. I lumped it with legal hold for this picture. What you really need is a traffic cop in the center saying, I'm aware of everything in here in this kind of content context awareness knowing what this stuff is, when and how it should be treated, and then either executing on that or sending out appropriate uh, notifications, authorizations, things like that, to say, hey, it's time to deal with this, and pushing that information forward in any one of these contexts. Obviously, that. Okay, so here's a client case study as promised. Um, what I would call putting it all together this notion of perpetual disposition, that sort of perpetual retention analysis, and then brought larger to, pretend, to perpetual everything analysis is what we call data under management. And so I'm gonna talk with you for just a few minutes about a major multinational oil and energy company that started out, their initial was legal hold. So we're gonna talk about them a lot next time. Uh, but that was their initial use case to say, hey, we, they had an acquisition. You know, we have 100 terabytes of stuff. Nobody knows what it is. Should it be under legal hold? And once that analysis was performed, it was a short hop to get to these other use cases to say, you know, as long as Powerhouse is evaluating that content for legal hold, perhaps we should evaluate it for retention. See records managers, we've got your back. And so he said, you know, as long as you're evaluating it, maybe we should figure out what you no longer need to keep. How much rot have you got? Turned out they had none. How rare is that? Uh, they had no rot and they, but you know, a hundred terabytes, it's millions and millions and millions of files, um, all technically subject to retention the minute it was acquired. And so getting that discipline into the legal department to folks that are oriented around litigation and legal hold, not everything in there, of course, needed to be under legal hold. What about that squishy middle? It wasn't rot. It wasn't under legal hold. What do? 
And so what do is put it under proper retention management. And that really opened the door to all these other capabilities that auto classification kind of naturally brings you anyway uh, for them to create proper data under management, which is what they now have. Um, for those who are curious, that was quite a lot of data. And so that was a powerhouse tier five, a black hat tier two, which is a 10 user uh, black hat and um, initially running at Valora, now on its way into the Azure cloud to run forevermore. So um, I'm hoping to have this client join me next time. If all works out and I'll let her speak in her own words instead of mine. So ultimately, we're getting to, and this is the whole, this is the point of the universal auto classification, to use auto classification to drive all of these discussions at once, not just retention, although that's certainly a goodie uh, to begin with, uh, because everything ultimately needs to, to be responsive to that. So um, re retention is a good a place to start as any, and having this notion of fully classified data under perpetual disposition with regular reporting and fully integrated into everything else. That's data under management and the whole point of this webinar series. And finally, I think I've alluded to this already, we focus today on retention, uh, but you can see the kind of crossbreeding that goes on. Uh, the easiest crossbreeding for records and for retention are, is definitely legal hold and rot analysis. So if you're looking to find uh, buddies or, or add to your chorus for of people saying, yes, yes, we need to do this, that is probably the closest place that you're going to find them, potentially also data privacy. And that is basically the end. We have two minutes left. Um, our next session is, as I said, as I said legal hold. Uh, you can click right here to register when we send this out to you, or you can go to the website and do the same. Um, I'll see if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer if there are. And I will hang out for a few minutes after if people want to chat. I love all your comments. Thank you so much. And here's one question. Does data need to be pre-processed before any analysis can be done? How does Powerhouse do this live within pre-processing? Um, that's a great question. And, and the answer is not really. Um, the kind of pre-processing that it, sort of, it does it anyway, but things that might kind of fall under a pre-process banner would be unpacking things like PSTs or zip files. Um, obviously virus detection, denisting, deduping, all the discovery folks know all those terms. Uh, but basically it's whatever has to happen to be able to get to, at that text, the, the, the content of the file. But at least at Valora, we consider that part of the processing as opposed to pre-processing. And then someone asks, how do I get these slides? Um, they're going to be automatically mailed to you probably in the next day or so. If you haven't received them by next week, by all means, please reach out to us and we will make sure that you get a copy. We also put a recording of the webinars up on our YouTube channel and you can always watch it 100 million times if you like. And then the last question said, how do you manage pictures? Hope for metadata. Um, Yes, uh, basically, if pictures have, there's sometimes hidden metadata, like might give you latitude, longitude, or some sort of uh, like GPS about that uh, picture. If it's a digital picture, we'll get that. Um, if it's literally just like a photograph, a scanned photograph, there isn't a whole lot of metadata and there isn't much we can do with that. Um, that being said, sometimes uh, pictures or maybe like blueprints, drawings, they often have a legend that would count as textual data and we can get metadata off of that. So it kind of depends on what exactly you've got for images ranging from we can't do anything to we can do quite a lot. So it's a little bit case specific. Alrighty, that looks like kind of the end of the questions. Um, again, I will be here for a bit if you want to share your thoughts with me. I know I can be provocative at times, so I appreciate you guys both listening and, and firing back at me. So um, thank you all for attending, and I wish you all the best. Hope to see you next time for our Legal Hold webinar.
Bye-bye.